Thank you for joining us today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others. Let's worship together. Psalm 107, verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Amen. It's good to know that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Him, and we know that the tomb is empty. And as we come in this morning, we come with grateful hearts, thanking God for what He has done, not only in our lives as individuals, but in the life of this church. Amen. I know that as you look around this morning, you may uh, notice that there's uh, some things missing and we are well into the process of moving and uh, we're excited. We are so excited about what God is doing. Uh, we're thankful for what God has done and we are looking with great anticipation to what God will do as we make this move because we know that He is the one who's orchestrated it. Amen. And so we're excited about it. We're glad that you're here this morning and trust that you've come for no other purpose but to worship King Jesus because He and He alone deserves our worship. He has been so very good to each one of us. And so we are glad that you're here. Will you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Father, 
thank you for loving us like you do. And thank you for the joy of being able to be here this morning. And thank you for that wonderful reminder this morning through song that uh, we are redeemed. And we need to be grateful for that. We need to shout that with, with every ounce of energy we have, God, to acknowledge what you have done for us. We thank you for our time together this morning. We ask now that you would bless as uh, we have an opportunity to uh, worship you through tithes and offerings. I pray that you would bless each gift and each giver and that you would use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom, specifically taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the joy of being here this morning. For We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You reach in front of you, grab your white hymnal. We've not done this in some time. Turn to page number 490. 490. As we stand to sing on Jordan's stormy banks, page 490. On Jordan's stormy banks, I stand and watch a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land. Where my possessions lie I am bound for the promised land I am bound for the promised land Oh, who will come and go with me I am bound for the promised land On the last, when shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed when shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest I am bound for the promised land I am bound for the promised land oh who will come Turn around and greet each other this morning. If you'll remain standing and take your copy of God's Word and turn with us to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 17. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 17. The Apostle Paul, to the church at Philippi, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned these words for us. Brethren... Be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Amazing grace, how sweet Save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 
was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious the that grace the hour I first. that we would recognize that we in and of ourselves are nothing. God, but it's by your grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves, God, but it is a gift from you. I pray that we wouldn't take that gift for granted. I pray that we wouldn't just sit with that gift all on our own, God, but we would take that gift out and share it to a lost and dying world. I pray that this morning you would teach us you would challenge us and you would change us. God, we are just thankful for what you're doing in the life of this church. I pray that we would continually as a church body be obedient and be faithful 
God, and trust that you are going to do mighty things in and through us, not because of us, but because of you. God, we surrender this morning to you. We surrender this service to you. We thank you for who you are, for all that you've done and all you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Eight o'clock. Look how many of you showed up. Last one, right? And uh, that's, that's kind of a historical milestone, you being here at the last 8 o'clock service. And we're glad that you are. And I just want to remind you, next week we have a guest speaker coming to be with us, a great preacher. He's going to be with our youth. They're having a revival. Please pray about this. Uh, youth revival starting actually starts Wednesday night uh, out at Haywood Community College with all of our kids Hopefully, as Haywood County, as many of them get in there, uh, and then coming in here, and our kids are going to have a revival here. If you want to come be a part of it, Mark won't be opposed. Uh, our, our number one goal is to get as many kids as we can in here, and uh, if we have to fill this up here with chairs, we will. That's what we want, see as many youth as we can in the house of God. I pray many will be saved. Um, you know, it worked out. We had all of this scheduled, and then uh, God moved us. And look back at the calendar. We flip-flopped, and we figured out what are we supposed to do. And uh, I then got to thinking, you know how beautifully God puts things together. Uh, I guess you could say, well, it'd be nice if the pastor preached uh, the final time in this building. But there is no final time. Final time would mean I'm going to die right after I preach that message. And I, I don't think I will, but uh, I could. Uh, we're going to move. The church is moving. We're just going to keep having church just in a different building, okay? So just keep that in mind. Next Sunday is not a funeral. Uh, it's a celebration. And I know that we've got a lot of memories here, and we've got a lot of that. That's okay. God permits that. Uh, I already have those moments. But uh, we're going to make a lot of memories on the other side. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning out of the book of Philippians, talking about this subject. Um, you won't have it on the screens. Uh, it, it's weird in here this morning for me. I'm so used to, to all the screens and the chairs, and uh, I, I told Scotty it feels naked in here. It just feels a little odd. And then you're seeing me in the dark because uh, we've had all them lights all this time, and you probably like this view a lot better. Uh, and I guess they can arrange that at the other buildings, keep me in the dark. But uh, uh, let's just look at it together, man. Uh, you know, the one thing, you don't have to have a screen to have a Bible. And we want you to look in your Bible today and follow along. We're preaching on this subject, a heavenly perspective. A heavenly perspective. You know, when I read this passage and was studying, I couldn't help but see the Apostle Paul sitting there with pen in hand and thinking about what he might write uh, to tell this young church, this church that's having a few issues. How many of you know churches have issues? Say amen. <laughs> right? This church has issues. The church at Philippi had issues. The, when you have people, you have issues. You have, a, you have problems. But, but what we're going to find today is a heartbroken and a weeping Paul. It's, it's going to be odd, too, as we study this, who he's weeping for. Why those tears are being shed. These tears are not for himself at all. They were shed on the behalf of others. But the others is what's very interesting. I want us to hear the heart of Paul. You cannot read this passage without seeing why God used Paul the way he did. It's impossible to look at this passage and not see why God would say, that's the man I've chosen to really lead the missionary movement uh, of the new church. And so as we look at it, I pray that we'll learn today. Let's break down the passage together. Look at verse 17. Brethren, now that would indicate he's talking to Christians, to the church. Be followers together of me. Any of you want to stand up today and say, hey, listen everybody, you need to follow my example. Anybody comfortable with that? And you know, when you read this, you think, well, Paul, that's a little egotistical, isn't it? That you would write, be a follower of me. 
So I want us to first think about this. Number one, to respect our examples. Respect our examples. Do you know there are people I believe we ought to be modeling our lives after? First, I think Jesus is at the top of that list. We want to be like Christ. Amen? But I also believe there have been people who've lived lives in front of us that's worth living a life like them. They're an example to us. We kind of used one last week with Alex Alexander quietly going about the business of trying to win people to Jesus. Paul is saying, take me for your model. That had to be tough for him to even write, but let's remember something. All scripture is inspired, and it was the Holy Spirit of God that was inspiring Paul to write this. I believe Paul probably argued a little maybe here and said, I I don't want to write that, but watch this now. I, I read this and it really made a lot of sense to me. The Holy Spirit's guiding Paul's heart, guiding his pen. And the Holy Spirit at this time had no better example to set before the church than the Apostle Paul. After all, why is he in prison? Because he's doing the work of the Lord. Why is He's so hated by the world because he is following and obeying Almighty God. And the Holy Spirit is saying, take Paul. He is a great role model for how you should model your lives. You know, it's scary to think that our generations coming up are really just little models of ourselves. You know, if there's things about you that you don't like, It might be worth changing so your kids don't do exactly the same thing because you are their model. I remember when Alex was a baby, she came around the corner and she had a tomato in her hand. She was eating it like an apple. I love tomatoes. I've always loved them. Her mama can't stand them. So when her mama saw her eating that tomato, she yelled out and Alex dropped the tomato and won't touch them. That's been years ago. Alex is not fond of tomatoes right now. You want to know why? Not because they didn't taste good to her. She was eating it. But because she thought, mama thought it was dangerous to eat a tomato. I have raised my kids that cats are dangerous. (laughs) Praying that I've raised them to where they'll never like them. Trying to be a role model to them. But the fact of it is, things we say are right, they trust, they believe. Things we say are wrong, they trust, they believe that. We are role models, and our little children come along behind us, and they're watching us. And what about the little kids in the church? You know, they're, they're role models. We're modeling that before them, and they're watching us. And friends, listen to me. If all they hear out of us is criticism, and all they hear out of us is complaints, And the nagging, it's fascinating to me. I could have already written a book as a pastor to show you how the family line of complaining follows suit. You take a complainer, and and dad's a complainer, and his kids grow up, and you sit down with them. You know what they do about church? They complain. They whine. They gripe. It just seems to be the most amazing thing. Where has that been modeled in front of them? They hear that all the time. Why do we go to church? To find what's wrong. That's why our family goes. Why do we do that? So that's been modeled in front of them. But you take a family that worships and a family that's plugged into God, and the same thing happens. The kids model that. I've watched preaching over the years, your children, while we're having church, if somebody raises their hand in worship, I've watched these little kids put their hand up. You know, when you say amen, those little kids say amen. And sometimes maybe not exactly in the right spot, but but that's okay. They've they've had that modeled in front of them. But here's what Paul is saying. I'm living my life in full allegiance or trying to for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm sitting in this prison cell not because I've done anything illegal, but because I'm following the Savior. I am living my life for the Savior. And I've taken all the world and all of its stuff, and it's nothing to me. And I want you to follow that example. Have a heavenly perspective. Understand that this is all going to end, and we're going to stand before Jesus one day. So take me. But, but he doesn't just stop with himself. Look at verse 17. 
He says also, mark them which walk so as you have us. So, so it wasn't just Paul, was it? He's saying there's some other guys out there. There's some other people. You should follow their example. You know, we need some godly spiritual role models, don't we? Not only do we need to be some, but some of us need that person in our life. We need godly spiritual people. Paul has been a model that has been proven. He's been consistent. We need consistency. Our children need consistency. They need to see a constant, consistent Christian. They need to see that. Would you be that for our children? Will you be that for those little ones running around? You know, a lot of times I think we take for granted. Mike came up Wednesday night and did a children's story. Uh, it was tremendous. I don't think any of us will ever get over Mike's children's story Wednesday night. And the, 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 the presence of God in here Wednesday, just sweet. You know, I always say, and I say this on a, a little side note. You know how you know when you're doing what God wants you to do? He comes in. He's happy with the people and he sits with the people and he blesses them. And that choir, man, they just blessed our socks off. And then Mike gives us that little story. But you know what? You know what's dangerous about that? Not just Mike's giving the story and that was dangerous, but the other part, the other part that was dangerous about it is, is every one of those kids now know who Mike is. Okay? And he has stood and taught them a lesson. Mike has stood and taught them to, to make sure you make time for God. Don't fill your bucket with everything else and then try to fit God and his word in. But that ought to be a priority. Well, as little as we think about it, those little minds, they soaked all that up. And they watch Mike, and they'll forever walk around this church, and they'll watch Mike. Mike's an example to them now, right? You know what they think? I'm coming at you, Mike. Hey, everybody else take a break. I'm preaching to Mike White right now, okay? <laughs> so here's what they think in their mind. If we've stood and taught them that, you know what they think about Mike? That every day Mike spends ample time in the Word of God. He doesn't fill his bucket. When I stand and preach and I say this is what you ought to do, little minds are sitting there thinking that's what he does. That's how he treats others, right? And so when you stand and teach a lesson and when you stand up and you give directions, then they expect that you'll follow your own directions. That's why our children get so confused when we tell them what they ought to do, but we won't do it ourselves. When we tell our children you shouldn't talk about others and then they hear us talking about others, it's very confusing to them. So let me ask you this. What kind of example are we? Paul says that he, he, he's saying, I believe I'm living my life in such a way that, and the Holy Spirit is allowing him to write this, wanting him to write this, follow my example. Be bold in your witness. Don't be ashamed. No matter the cost, get the gospel out. Listen, that's the priority. The priority is the gospel. And that's what he's saying. It reminds me of the verse, 1 Peter 5, 3 says, Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. That's what we've been called to. Not lording over it, but being examples over the flock. How many of you right now could write down a name that was an example to you of what a Christian ought to be. Can you go back? You remember, was you a child or as an adult? And maybe some people in this very room are coming to your mind. I thought of, uh, of the funerals that I have done and, and how some of those people, I could literally stand and say, this is a good person to model your life after. This is a person that... That, that you ought to, we ought to take as an example. And that's what we could say about the Apostle Paul. Let me ask you this. Who do you look up to? And, and why do you look up to them? There's a news story broke this week about a lot of the athletes in pro sports. How many of them have come out and said that they smoked pot and done drugs right before they played their games? Many of them uh, this week coming out and saying, yeah, we did that all the time. And a lot of kids are modeling their lives after that, right? And that's been their example. And now their examples are coming out and saying that. And, and you know, I, I just think about a few things that have happened here in Haywood County lately. And, 
And, and I can name one family that's been tragic. It's been in the papers and drugs got involved and the daddy is dead. The mama is deeply into drugs right now. Recently just taken to jail over what she done. Her children both involved in drugs can't get, listen, it's just following cycle. The example that was set before them. You know, I, I think we need, we need some spiritual examples. Amen, church? But let's talk about what spirituality means. I, I think a lot of people have spiritual. Uh, it, it's, it's a word that we've kind of messed up. What do you think of when I say be spiritual? I mean, if you think about who you've looked up to, is it somebody spiritual or not? What, what about if you were in Bible times, would you have followed Abraham or would you have followed Lot? I mean, Lot followed Abraham for a while, right? But, but then he decided to do his own thing. And then we look at Lot's family. Remember Lot's family? And he set the example for them. So when it came crunch time and God's trying to spare them, they have to drag them out of the city. The dad had set the example for the entire family. I, I was thinking about this. Would you have followed Ahab or Elijah? Who would you listen to? What kind of example are we? I want to be a spiritual Christian. But here's what I think of. When we use the word spiritual Christian, I think we think of this mystical, dreamy, impractical, distant person. When they pray, they go into another voice. You know, spiritual people start praying in the King James. <laughs> you know, where, where we, we've got King James language. We've heard it our whole life, the these and the thous. So we're just talking to one another and then we start praying, Oh, thou Father who sits high on the heaven. And we start going in. We think of spiritual and mystical. We have this view. A lot of the world has this view of what they see in the, in the churches that are very liturgical and the robed priests coming in and they say that's spiritual. But that's not at all. Listen, spiritual people, it's not that at all, changing your voice to pray or or, or the way you dress, or the way you carry your Bible. <clears throat> you know, we've got our certain ways. You look around, people trying to be spiritual sometimes that are not so spiritual. Listen to what it means to be spiritually minded. It means to look at earth from heaven's perspective. Why are we here? What is the goal? When you stand before God, do you really think he's going to talk to you about your job that you had? Do you think you'll get to heaven and God will say, I think, wasn't you a pretty decent plumber? I've got a pipe leaking over here. There won't be any leaky pipes in heaven. Your job is a way of provision. God's provided for, but that's, that's not what God... Listen, when we look at earth from a heavenly perspective, I want us to catch this now, we start seeing people the way God sees them. They're either saved or lost. And our heart ought to start breaking. And so when we think about being spiritually minded, I'm walking around here on this earth thinking, man, I'm telling you, there is an eternity coming. What's going to happen to these people? And our hearts ought to break thinking about where they're going to spend eternity. But most of us, we're not spiritually minded because we sit around and we don't think about their eternity where they're going. We judge them. We talk about them. We say mean things about them. Spiritually minded people don't do that. The spiritual mind makes the believer think more clearly. We walk through this earth thinking clearly. Guess what? This is not all there is. Did you know that? This is not all there is. We're just passing through here. But we live as if this is all there is. Spiritually minded people say that's just not that big a deal. When in, 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 eternal, in eternal perspective, that's not that big a deal. Whether my team won or lost, not that big a deal in eternity. I don't think God's going to have a, a, a roll call up there and say, let me bring forward all the national champions. And I don't think God's going to have a store where you can go buy collegiate gear. You know, where you're going to walk around wearing Alabama stuff or Georgia stuff or Carolina stuff. I know there won't be any Duke stuff there in heaven. <laughs> there, there's not going to be any of that. 
Listen, what's going to be around us in heaven? All that's going to be there is the treasure we laid up there. And the treasure are those things that God treasured. And God treasures souls. God treasures people. And spiritually minded means we walk on this earth with the perspective of eternity. Why are we living like our homes and our land and our stuff? That's where it's all at. It is not. You're leaving all of that. You are leaving all of that. It's been amazing to me how, how many churches that you go in, they, they just sit on money like it's the greatest treasure. They, they hoard money up in the church bank accounts. And you've got people sitting in the church just watching every penny as if that's the most important. While men and women are dying without Christ all over the world. Do you know how much mission work we could do if we all gathered up, took the funds of churches and said, let's go win the world? Let's go win the world. Most churches' missions account is less than their fellowship hall accounts. They put more money in eating than they do winning souls. Isn't that sad? Isn't that heartbreaking? Church, if we're going to be spiritually minded, if we're going to respect our examples and be examples, we need to walk through this earth with a spiritual mind. I need to raise kids with a spiritual mind. We need to raise our children, our grandchildren saying, listen, that's not what you ought to value. That's just stuff. That stuff is going to fade away. It's going to rust. It's going to rot. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's where we're going to spend eternity. You know, the other day I was having a discussion with one of our church members and he looked at me and he said, you know, three score and ten, that's not that long. The Bible says you have lived a full life at three score and ten. Seventy. Seventy. Do you know Marvin Downs just turned 80? Marvin is on ten years of borrowed time. (laughs) Have you ever thought, how many of you in here are over 70? Would you please raise your hand? Over 70? How many of you are really close to 70? Would you raise your hand? Oh, really close. You're knocking on the door. <laughs> and you, you think about that. And, and I was thinking, that just sit on me when he said that. Three score and ten. So I'm past middle age. I'm not middle aged. Now I want you to think about how brief that span is. Look in the paper on a daily basis of how many people die in their 70s. The Bible says the full life. And after that, anything else is borrowed time. Do you realize how brief your span on this earth is? Do you realize how long eternity is? Then I want to ask you something. Why are we putting so much stock in that brevity, in that little tiny piece Why are we so bent that this little tiny piece is where it's all at when, listen, we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. So we need to have a spiritual mind and we need to be examples and we need to follow people who have spiritual minds. You know who I want surrounding me? You know who I want to talk to? You know the counsel that I'm looking for? I want spiritually minded counsel. That's what I want. I want somebody who's looking at things from a heavenly perspective. They see things with the correct eyes. Let's look on because now this is going to get a little bumpy. I want everybody, if you would, if you would put your seats in the upright position and buckle up. Look number two, not only remember, respect our examples, let's remember our enemies. Watch what Paul says. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, church, we can't escape the fact that we're always going to have people against what we stand for. Never has there been a time there's been more of that than there is now. There are a lot of people against what we stand for. Did you know as we make this move, we're all excited, there's a lot of people unhappy. We took an entertainment facility that's supposed to bring tax dollars to Haywood County. And there was so much hope that that would be what that is again. I walked around the building one day and a man was sitting there getting ready to to do some work and 
he'd been called up there to check something out. He's sitting in his truck. He rolls his window down and said, hey, he said, uh, somebody buy this? And I said, yes, they did. And he said, what's it going to be? I said, a church. Boy, he was upset. He said, a church? He was so frustrated. You know, we're always going to have people who are against what we stand for. Now, listen, that's one thing to have out in the world. It's real hurtful when you have it in the church. When you have it among you. When you have it right among God's people, or so-called God's people. Paul's often warned. He said it in the verse. He said the word often. I've told you about these people often. We can't be sure exactly who Paul's talking about, but there's indicators he's talking about the Judaizers again. You remember that group that added it's Jesus plus circumcision? It's Jesus plus the dietary laws. You have to follow a certain diet or you're no good or you're not going to meet up the criteria. They added the law of Moses to the work of redemption. It's very likely in verse 18 and 19, that's who Paul's talking about. And I want you and I to sit down right now with our Bibles and think about Paul with his pen. He lays his pen down for a second and the tears dripping off of his cheeks as he thinks about this group of people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. You know what I've learned? I'm learning this as I go, that anybody who adds to or tries to take away from the cross of Christ is an enemy of the cross of Christ. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. There's no middle ground. You either believe in what I'm doing or you don't believe in what I'm doing. And people, we got to be careful. Their obedience to the Old Testament dietary laws made a God out of their belly. Look, look at verse 19. Paul says their end is destruction. Listen to me, Calvary Road. You want to know why Paul is weeping? He is weeping because he's thinking about people, listen to me, that he loved. He said they're enemies of the cross, but that didn't mean he didn't love them. I want you to hear the heart of Paul. No wonder God used him. No wonder God used him. Hey, by the way, let's all stop and think for a second now. Paul used to be one of these guys. And when he sits around and he sees them, and they're so bent that they're right, did you know it is entirely positive, possible to be extremely intent but be wrong in your intention, right? You can be sincere and be wrong. Judaizers were sincere people. They were not coming out to, to, to just be mean and hostile. They truly believed the way was dietary laws, the laws of Moses. They truly believed that you had to keep those things. That was their genuine belief. And when Paul thought about them, his heart broke. Because here's why he started thinking, man, they're going to miss heaven. They're sincere, but they're going to miss heaven. It ought to break our heart this morning how many people are legitimately sincere, but they're going to miss heaven. You know, these men were not spiritually minded. They were earthly minded. Paul writes about it in these verses. He said they mind earthly things. He said their God is their belly. And, and that's an indicator that it could be that, that he's talking about them and their dietary laws. Their God is their belly. They say, hey, it's what you put in your belly. But he goes on to say this, that, that their glory is in their shame and they mind earthly things. And if you look at verse 19, it means they set their mind on earthly things. They are not spiritually minded. They are earthly minded. They're holding on to earthly rituals and beliefs that God had given to Israel. And they're opposing the heavenly blessings that had been given through Christ. Let me back up and say this right here. Listen to Paul. They mind earthly things. Can I be, it's going to be hard to be this today, but I think we've got to go to this building and get our minds right. We've got to get our minds right. Okay? God's provided a place for us to worship. But he did not provide us a building to worship. We're not to worship the building. 
were not to worship the possible new building. If we have a heavenly perspective, we realize that the reason God's sending us there is to reach more people. The most important thing that's going on is not the building. The most important thing that's going on is not building the new building. For a building can neither go to heaven or hell. But people do. Families do. And I thought, if over the last few weeks, the people that have come at us with every idea about a building and come at us wanting to know who said to do this and who said to do that and have made calls or or come next to us and said, well, whose idea was that? And I thought, I thought, you know, that's what happens. That's just the natural way we are. But if we as a church have a heavenly perspective, we would say none of that matters. If we put the same amount of intensity in reaching people for Jesus as we did in saying, who done this or who said to do that? You want to know something? I trust the committee we formed. God will lead them. How many of you believe God's already got a plan for our next building and it'll cover what we need? I fully believe that. God's in charge of that. That's not the big thing. The big thing God wants us to do, God's saying to his church is, I am putting you in a place that you can win more people. Please have a heavenly perspective and would you please remember people need the Lord. There are people who dislike what we stand for, but if we could win them to Jesus, they'll make a complete turn and they'll get to go to heaven with us. And I would to God that we will sit down in the church up there and weep over lost people. I would that we would spend more hours awake at night thinking about how people are dying without Christ as we do thinking about who decorated that or who said we ought to do that. That is not what's important. We are going to leave that here. That will become the Antichrist building. Okay? (laughs) That's what we're going to glory. And folks, I would hate to know that I spent the bulk of my time on this earth lording over stuff like buildings without concern about the real thing that matters. Boy, God convicted me this week. Hey, John, how much time have you been thinking about that building? How many people you witnessed to the last few weeks? How many people have you told about me? I get up this morning, I flip the news on, a man walked into a Waffle House in Nashville, Tennessee. He killed three. He wounded more before they could wrestle the rifle away from him. Completely out of his mind. Drive around Haywood County, folks. Let's open our eyes. They're everywhere. They're wandering the streets. The drug crisis, it's, it's, it's blown up. God is sending us up there not to worship a building, not to worship property. That's just a means. God said, look, I'm going to provide the facility. Your job is to get the people. That's your job. I'll take care of that. And when he looks into us, And he sees a body of believers moving forward with a kingdom focus, only focused on reaching people for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, we don't have any financial thing to think about. The God who owns it all will take care of the finance. He'll take care of the building. And I assure you, we're not going up there to build a Taj Mahal. We're not going up there so people can drive by and say, Oh, what a building. Oh, what a building. But we want people to drive by and say, man, what's going on in that building that's changing so many lives? Is there something that I'm missing? 
and we bring people in. You want to know how we'll know things are working correctly? When we start bringing people into that building and sitting them down saying, hear the gospel, hear what Jesus has done for you, and we watch them giving their lives to Jesus. And Paul said, you say, how do you even come up with that out of that scripture? Look, he laid his pen down and wept over a group of people because their only concern was earthly things. Church, it's amazing. If we're not careful, the enemy's going to take us and use us against one another over earthly things. We'll lose our kingdom focus because all we can think about is the building or how's this going to happen, right? When it ought to be about people. Listen to how John Phillips wrote. Can you imagine the scene in the prison cell in Rome as Paul wrote, these verses. The jailer who's chained to him, brilliant, inquiring mind Paul is, gentle heart, indomitable will. The jailer looks and sees tears well up in this prisoner's eyes and running down his cheeks. Cheer up, man, the soldier says. Things aren't all that bad. After all, you're a Roman citizen, and one of these days you'll be free. They don't crucify Romans, at least not here in Rome they don't. Paul blinks away the tears and smiles and looks at the jailer. You misunderstood. It's not for myself that I weep. Oh, the soldier says. Then it's for your friends or for your wife or for your kids. I hope they're all right. You'll be free again soon. Don't, don't worry about it. Mark my words. Cheer up, Paul. Everything's going to be all right. I'm not weeping for my family or my friends. I'm weeping for my foes. Well, sir, they'll get their just dessert one of these days. You wait and see. And I hope they get a good taste of the lash. Innocent you are, Paul. We all know that. Paul says, you misunderstand, my friend. I'm not weeping out of resentment. I'm not weeping because of them. I am weeping for them. Can you imagine what would happen if our heart was like the heart of Paul? Paul thought of these people in an eternity they were going to spend separated from Christ. My heart breaks. God break it more. I occasionally have a sad thought that God helped me to have a broken heart more. We often pray God convict the lost. But maybe we need to pray this morning, God, convict me. God, break their heart that they're going to die without you. But maybe we need to pray this morning, God, break our heart that they're dying without you. Break our heart. I promise you, if we came in this building this morning with a heavenly perspective and our thoughts were on lost people, then this move and the details of this move wouldn't be anything. Wouldn't matter. We'd be saying, yeah, it's got to be done, but here's the reason it's got to be done. You know what propels us to keep going? It's for them, <laughs> right? It, we, we didn't, God didn't give us that building for us. He did give us a place to worship. God's providing that building for people who don't even know him yet. Be a papa that your grandson wants to get saved. Be a grandmother that your granddaughter and grandson want to know Jesus. But don't sit at the table and tell them that the most important thing about church is how the budget's going. Or irritated on who's calling the shots. <laughs> Amen? Let them see Jesus in you. Those things can be talked about. They'll be talked about. Everything's got to be done decency and order. They'll be talked about in committee meetings. That'll be handled. But let's handle it with a heavenly perspective. Saying the reason we want to do this right is so more people can come to Jesus. I don't know. I'm telling you straightforward this morning. I'd rather get more calls that said, Preacher, I'm hurting today. I got a lost friend. I want to witness to him. Be much better than getting a call saying, well, why'd you do that? What are they going to do here? Who said they could do that? How much that cost? 
Wouldn't it be great for us to come together and sit and say, man, I talked to some people this week about Jesus. I, I, I think they're coming. Let's pray, preacher. Let's pray together that they'll come get saved. You know why? Because we all do it, and I'm preaching to myself. We all do it because we're earthly minded. We need a heavenly perspective. And then Paul says we need to regard our eternity. Look at verse 20 and verse 21. We've, we've learned a few things already to respect our examples, and let's be an example. Number two, remember our enemies. And when I say enemies, listen, there are people who are against what we stand for, believe, and let's weep over people who are dying without Christ. And then thirdly, regard our eternity. Look at verse 20 and verse 21. Our conversations in heaven. Hey, you know what conversation means? Right, I hear it. Citizenship. Did you know where you're a citizen of? Heaven. I've told you an illustration before when I got that grade in conduct. They used to give grades in conduct. And I got a C. And it's the worst punishment I've ever been given. And I remember, I remember dad's exact words. Listen to what he said. That grade you got reflects on me. It reflects on how I'm raising you. We have the same last name. You're my son. Guess what I got in conduct the next time I got a report call? I started conducting myself a little better. And do you know by the way we're conducting ourselves, it's a reflection on where our citizenship is. Okay? Now listen. If I didn't preach like this, I, I guess I'd love you. But when you leave church and go to a restaurant and you sit and gripe, the tables next to you are listening and you know what you're reflecting? You know who that's reflecting on? You know where that causes people to think? You know what's going on? Man, save that stuff. Eat it. Holler it in your pillow when you get home. But people next to you who need the Lord don't need to hear that. And you might legitimately have a reason to be upset, but you need to hold it in. The Greek word translated conversation or citizenship, it's, listen to where we get the word. We get the same English word politics from. Ooh, that's sad, isn't it? It has to do with one's behavior as a citizen of a nation. You know, when we got saved, we became citizens of heaven. The minute you got saved, your name was written on the roll of heaven. Ain't that great? So actually, yes, you live in America, but you're a citizen of heaven. You're a child of the king. The way I conduct myself reflects directly on the king. Directly. That's convicting to me. I assure you I'm not just preaching at you. I'm preaching to me. I'm preaching to me. I've had an earthly mind. I've thought more of the building than people. That's easy to do. And there have been moments here lately I've not conducted myself in a way that reflects where I live very well. And the father has to say, John, you just got your grades. Let me show you what you got in conduct. But Lord, look how I've done administratively. Look at all the stuff we've got done. I don't care. It's your conduct that I'm thinking about. It's the conversations you've had with other people. It's, it's the way that you've walked around and done the things you've done has not been a good reflection on me. And Paul reminds us right here, we need to regard where we're really going. I am a citizen of heaven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. I got saved. He wrote my name down. I belong there. That's where basically the Bible says we're already there. We're as much as we're there. I've got a name place already at the table. I'm going to have a heavenly escort to my seat for the marriage supper of the Lamb. I wonder who I'll sit next to. I wonder who will be across the table from me. 
Think about where we're headed when we get saved. None of us wants to, uh, this is terrible, but think about this. There was a man by the name of Philip Nolan in the classic tale, The Man Without a Country. He cursed the name of his country. So you know what they done? They sentenced him to live on a ship and never again see his native land. He couldn't hear its name. He couldn't hear any news about its progress. He had to live on that ship for 56 years. He's on an endless journey from ship to ship and sea to sea. And finally, he's buried at sea, a man without a country. That's not me today. I'm a man with a country that has been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Christian's name is written in the book of life. And that's determining his final entrance into that heavenly country. When I stand over there, the records will be checked. Is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? And Paul says this, we are looking for, looking for. Look what he says in verse 20. Our conversation in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior. How many of you are looking for the Savior this morning? He's coming again. Pay attention to Russia. Pay attention to Syria. The Bible says Damascus will be completely annihilated. That is a prophecy that's going to come true. Do you know where we bombed the other day? Do you know where we attacked the other day and sent a message to Syria? Damascus. Pay attention to what God is saying. He's coming again. And I'm telling you, you and I need to get up every day looking for the Savior. You know what the word looking for means? Eagerly looking for I'm not looking like, oh, is he coming today? Because I had something I wanted to do. I got a fishing trip I'd like to take. No, we ought to wake up and say, I'm so sick of the sin of this world. I am so sick and tired of the pain and the awfulness. I'm ready, Lord, and I'm looking for you because you're the best thing that ever happened to me. Have you ever been homesick? You just couldn't wait to get home? That's the way heaven ought to feel for us. And the more of our folks that go on over, the more homesick we get. Homesick for heaven. And you know what the Bible goes on to say? Watch this, verse 21. When we get there, he shall change our vile body. That is correct. You have a vile body. I have a vile body. And it will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. There's all kinds of questions about what that body will be like. I, I know this. When Jesus presented himself to the disciples, he just passed through walls. <laughs> he just appeared. You study scripture. It's not like he knocked on the door. They'd be sitting there and there he was. There he was in front of them. I'm not sure what those bodies are going to be like, but I'll tell you that this. They'll be better than what we got right now. Anybody in here excited about a new body? Anybody in here just eagerly waiting for that, a body like unto his own, the Bible teaches us. We are eagerly looking forward to being with him. We are citizens of heaven living on earth. And you know what? We should never be discouraged looking at it from that perspective because we know that the Lord is one day going to return. He faithfully keeps on doing his job we just keep doing our job because we know he's coming again. We know we're going to be with him. Spiritually minded believers, we don't live for the things of this world. It's not about buildings, man. It's about that place we're going to be with him. And I'm just saying all of that this morning because I truly want this church to leave this building next week saying it's not about this building. This was a place God provided for his work to get done for a period of time for this group of believers. Now he's provided another place, but it's not about that building either. We will not go bow our knee to the building in Maggie. We will go in that building and we will bow our knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we will do this with a heavenly perspective. Amen. Amen. And the Bible teaches last in that verse, he's able to subdue all things to himself. The word subdue, listen to it, it's great. To arrange in ranks. To arrange in ranks. I found out that's my problem. Might be your problem too. We don't arrange things in proper order. We've got our order wrong, right? 
And if we're going to have a heavenly perspective, we've got to get the order right. My Randy Kilby was our pre president when I first went to Fruitland. And Mr. Kilby would get up often my first quarter there and he would say this. <laughs> so good. And I had to take a little time to figure it out because I, you know, I was raised on Hot Creek. Takes me a few minutes. He said, some of you, some of you need to get some priorities and put some first. I'd be back there thinking, what in the world is he talking about? Your priorities are out of order. I figured it out. We got the order wrong. Need to get our rank right, right? And some of us today, our values are twisted. Consequently, we waste a lot of our energy on useless activities. And our vision is so clouded that the return of Christ is not a motivating power in our lives. Living in the future tense means letting Christ arrange the things of our life in order. I want you to think about this. If you were living your life with heaven in view, there'd be an awful lot of what you're putting so much stock in just won't be important. That, that, that's just not that important. One time at my house, I thought I had grubs in my yard. It's been several years ago. We hadn't been there long. I was trying to get the grass to grow. It started coming in, and I started having these circles in the yard. I literally am not lying to you. I laid awake at night with those circles in my yard. And I'll never forget, we had the youth all over to our house. And one of those youth went out on the porch and looked over my yard. He started making all these jokes about how those grubs was doing crop dust and circling my yard. I called people. I researched grubs in my yard. What in the world's going on? They're killing my grass. Kept me awake. I'd stand out in the yard and get so frustrated. You know what I found out? If I would live with a heavenly perspective, I'd realize, so what? I've got a neighbor that's dying without Christ. I've got family members living away from the Lord. wonder what matters more, whether your grass is growing or people are dying without Christ. And if we realized where we're going to spend eternity, folks, I believe what happens is God starts getting the order of our rank together. He starts saying, I, not a priority, not even a priority, John. Put that down way down at the bottom of the list. I got something else for you to be doing. It means living with eternity's values in view. Daring to believe God's promise. Saying, God, we want what you want. And we're going to do this with a heavenly perspective. As we stand today, every head bowed. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart and you desire to serve him and to worship him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together.